Welcome to Chapter 8 in our course on Design of Machine Elements, MEC 410. This week, we're going to learn about the kinematics of gears. The reading is Chapter 8 of our book on Machine Elements in Mechanical Design, 6th edition. Your homework problems are from the textbook shown here. On the first three noted, make sure only to compute the values that we computed in the class slides because there's a boatload of gear dimensions and some of them aren't that important. So we're just going to give you the ones that are the major ones to do. We have one additional homework problem which tests your knowledge of a couple of other details. Gears are toothed cylindrical wheels used for transmitting motion and power from one rotating shaft to another. When you use gear drives in mechanical design, normally you decrease speed and increase torque from the input to the output shaft. It's a very efficient way of transmitting power. For spur gears, you often get efficiencies over 99% for how much energy is transmitted. Here we show a couple of different gearboxes. These pictures were in our textbook. It shows the external view of a gear reducer and then the internal view in this gear reducer box. Not only do you go through what looks to be three gear reductions, but you also change the direction of your rotation by 90 degrees, which is done with the bevel gear pair on the left side of the gearbox. Gear drives are fixed transmissions, which means that all components are rigidly mounted to fixed shafts usually inside a sealed housing. And alignment down to a couple of thousandths of an inch is critical. The speed reduction ratio is calculated from the speed of the pinion, this small part here, small n sub p, divided by the speed of the gear, this large gear here, small n sub g. And that's equal to capital N sub G, which is the number of teeth you count in this large gear, divided by capital N sub P, which is the number of teeth we count in the pinion. The torque increase ratio is 1 over the speed reduction ratio. So if your speed is reduced by a factor of 4, your torque will be increased by a factor of 4. Gear drives give you very large increases in torque from a high speed, low torque power source, usually some type of motor or in the case of a gasoline engine, the actual motion of the gas fired pistons. This increase in torque is accomplished in a very tight package space such as the automobile transmission shown on the left side. With a pair of gears, you will usually get a change in direction of rotation speed and in a differential for rear wheel drive gas powered cars, that directional change will actually be 90 degrees. So here on the right side, we show a diagram of the gears in a differential where the black gear comes from the transmission and the yellow and blue gears are part of the differential and the yellow shafts here, one over here, one to the right where my mouse is, those go to the rear wheels of the vehicle. We can look at a GIF file here in order to actually see the motion. The two yellow shafts are rotating at the same angular velocity and in the same direction. Here's a picture of all the gears that we're going to study in this book and then some. I'll highlight a few of these real quick and then we'll go through them in detail. Here we have our most common gears known as spur gears where the teeth are in a straight direction relative to the plane of the gear. Here's a big one, there's a medium spur gear, small one. In helical gears the teeth are curved and that gives you a similar rotational direction as the spur gears but with much less noise. In these straight bevel gears over here we change the direction of rotation by 90 degrees as was shown in the differential. You can have internal spur gears, you can have external spur gears, you can have a rack and pinion where you have a pinion here which is round and the rack is straight and that's what is used in most of your steering mechanisms. And you have what's called a worm and a worm gear pair where the worm is more like a screw thread than a gear. The worm gear is more like a spur gear 
When you drive a worm gear from a worm, you can get an enormous increase in torque that none of these other gears on the page can give you. Let's look at how a spur gear drive works. In both pictures on the top, gear one, meaning the yellow one, is going clockwise, which means gear two is going counterclockwise. As gear one rotates in the counterclockwise direction, each of their teeth is going to engage in a pair of teeth of gear two, where gear one is what's called the driver gear, meaning it has the power source behind it, and gear two is being driven by gear one. So in this example, tooth B1 on gear one is in between teeth A2 and B2 of gear two. But here on the right, What's happened is B1 tooth has rotated clockwise so that it's no longer fully engaged between teeth A2 and B2. On the other hand, driven tooth A2 is now fully engaged between the driver gears A1 and B1. Let's take a look at another GIF file and you can watch the motion directly. And note that the smaller gear is rotating faster than the larger gear, and thus the larger gear will have more torque on it than the smaller gear. Here's some advantages of a gear drive. For one, the gear drives are much more compact than chain or belt drives because the center distance between the gears is very small. They can operate at higher speeds than either belts or chains. They have a greater range of speed ratio than belts or chains. You can transfer high mechanical power at high speed much more efficiently than with belts or chains. The metal gears do not deteriorate with age, heat, or oil, which is similar to the sprockets and the chains. Let's discuss the involute curve. Involute curve is one of a class of geometric curves called conjugate curves. They're nonlinear, and there's no equation that you can write that governs an involute curve. Here's how you would form involute curves one and two. Wrap a string around base circle one. Then anchor the string at this location and here along the arc, tie a pencil to the string. When you take the pencil and rotate it, you form in value at one. Similarly, if you were to wrap a string around base circle two and anchor that string where my mouse is now, tie a pencil at this arc location and draw an arc. You would then create involute curve two, which is tangent to involute curve one and intersecting the common tangent line. Then what you would do is you would take involute curve one and use it to draw the side of this tooth here and you would take involute curve two and use it to form the side of a gear tooth, which would be on the gear that is part of base circle two. With the tangents arcs of involute one and involute two, and with the motion of the gear such that the involute arcs are forming the side walls of the teeth as the teeth mesh and the gears rotate, you'll get a very smooth motion and a transfer of power between the teeth. Let's discuss gear tooth geometry. When two gears are in mesh, they behave as if two smooth rollers were rolling on each other without slipping. The surface of each roller defines the pitch circle. So here where my mouse is, is the pitch circle of a gear. And the pitch diameter is the diameter of the pitch circle. The circular pitch P is the circumferential distance on the pitch circle from a point on one tooth, so there's our first point, to the corresponding point on the adjacent tooth. There's our second point. This arc length is defined as the circular pitch. And the pitch of two gears in mesh must be identical. Here's some spur gear geometry equations. Capital N is the number of teeth in a spur gear. Small p is the pitch, capital D is the pitch diameter. 
The circular pitch P is equal to pi times the pitch diameter divided by the number of teeth. The diametral pitch, capital P sub D, is equal to capital N sub P divided by capital D sub P. It's the number of teeth in the pinion divided by the diameter of the pinion. And this pitch diameter is equal to the number of teeth in the gear divided by the diameter of this larger gear. In metric terms, the metric module small m is equal to the pitch diameter of the pinion divided by the number of teeth of the pinion, and that's equal to the diameter of the gear divided by the number of the teeth of the gear, which means that the metric module is 25.4 divided by the diametral pitch because 25.4 millimeters equals one inch. The radius of the pinion is half the diameter of the pinion, and the radius of the gear is half the diameter of the gear. The center distance, which is from the center of this first gear all the way to the center of this second one, that center distance is equal to the diameter of the pinion plus the diameter of the gear divided by two. And here at the bottom, we do some more manipulations with the diametral pitch. We show that the center distance is equal to the number of teeth in the pinion and the gear divided by two times the diametral pitch. In this slide, we show two mating teeth in action. The line of centers is the line that connects the centers of the two gears. The line of action shows the direction of the radial force that gets transmitted between the gears. Both the line of centers and the line of action are lines drawn perpendicular to the flat surface of the gear teeth, which is shown here with my mouse. There's the flat surface. Here's a line of centers perpendicular to that line. Here is a line of action that's perpendicular to this flat top of the gear tooth. The base circle of each of these gears is inboard of the pitch circles. We show this tangent to the base circles. That's this blue line here. And we show another blue line, which is going through the center of the tooth. And the angle that gets formed between the tangent line to the base circles and this tangent line to the pitch circles is known as the pressure angle phi. This slide shows spur gear geometry problem number 8-1. For input data, we have that the gear has 44 teeth, the pinion has 22, which would get us a two to one gear ratio, and the diametral pitch P sub D is 12. The gear pitch diameter D sub G is then N sub G, which is 44 divided by P sub D is 12, that gets you 3.67. The pinion pitch diameter D sub P becomes 22, which is the number of teeth in the pinion, divided by 12, the diametral pitch. The circular pitch, small p, is pi divided by 12, which is 0.26. And the center distance is 2.75, which comes from 3.67 plus 1.83, and divide by 2. This slide shows how a helical gear drive works. In a helical gear, the teeth are inclined at the helix angle. Parallel axis helical gears are used extensively in automobile transmissions because they're very quiet. You can have right-handed teeth, shown here where my mouse is, which means that when the gear is laid down flat, the teeth appear to lean right. Or you can have a left-handed helix pair with left-handed teeth, which means when you lay the gear down and look at the teeth, the teeth appear to lean left. These gears in this diagram have a 45 degree helix angle, which is why you're able to see the curving of the teeth through space. On the plus side, helical gear drives run very quietly due to a tooth assuming load gradually as the gears rotate rather than all at once. And they have greater strength than spur gear teeth do for the same size gear. But on the negative side, they cost more than spur gears. And with helical gears, you introduce an axial component of force on the mating shaft. 
and this axial component of the force requires a thrust bearing to support the force. Now we're going to show you another GIF file that shows how helical gears mesh. Don't look at this GIF file too long, it's actually quite mesmerizing watching the gear teeth engage. It's actually one of the best GIF files I've ever seen. This slide shows you the direction of the primary helical gear forces. These arc lines here on the base cylinder of the gear are the center lines of the teeth. Tangential force WT acts tangential to the pitch surface and perpendicular to the shaft axis. So here's WT and that's the direction of that force. Radial force WR acts towards the center of the mating gears, tending to push them away from each other. So here's the direction of radial force WR. And axial force WX acts parallel to the shaft. So here's WX, it's parallel to this axis of the shaft, which would be the shaft that goes through the gear. And axial force WX is also known as the thrust force which must be supported by a thrust bearing. The plane containing the tangential force WT and the axial force WX is known as the tangential plane. And in this tangential plane, we have the angle psi, which is the helix angle. It's the angle between the tangential force and this hypotenuse of this triangle made up of tangential force and axial force. The plane containing the tangential force WT, there's WT, and the radial force, there's WR, is known as the transverse plane. And we have this angle phi sub T, which is the angle between the hypotenuse and the tangential plane, and that's known as the transverse pressure angle. The plane containing the true normal force WN and the radial force WR is known as the normal plane. So here's the true normal force WN and here's the radial force WR and we have this angle phi sub N and that's known as the normal pressure angle. Here's how circular pitch and normal circular pitch are defined in helical gears. The circular pitch is the distance from a point on one tooth to the corresponding point on the next adjacent tooth. Different from the spur gear, you have to measure the circular pitch at the pitch line in the transverse plane. So there we go, there's P here. And the normal circular pitch, P sub N, is the distance between the corresponding points on adjacent teeth when measured on the pitch surface in the normal direction. So here is P sub N, and it's actually going on a normal line. And pitches P and P sub N are related by the following equation. P sub N equals P times cosine of psi, where psi is the helix angle. The diametral pitch in a helical gear is the ratio of the number of teeth in the gear to the pitch diameter which is the same definition as for spur gears. But if you want to calculate the diametral pitch PD for a helical gear, you have to measure it in the transverse plane, which is down here. And that's why the diametral pitch for a helical gear is sometimes called transverse diametral pitch. And you calculate diametral pitch in the same way as the spur gear, you take n, the number of teeth, and you divide by this diameter d. There's also a normal a diametral pitch, p sub n d, in a helical gear, and it's the equivalent diametral pitch in the plane normal to the teeth. And we calculate p sub n d is we take the diametral pitch p d, and we divide by the cosine of the helix angle. Here's helical gear geometry problem number 8-41 for us to solve. It says that a helical gear has a transverse a diametral pitch of 8, a transverse pressure angle of 14 and a half degrees, 
45 teeth, a face width of 2 inches, and a helix angle of 30 degrees. And they want us to compute the various geometrical terms that we've discussed in the prior slides. So here's how we do it. Up here in the gray shaded area, we have the number of teeth 45, transverse diametral pitch P sub D is 8, the transverse pressure angle phi sub T shown as 14.5 degrees and a helix angle of 30 degrees. The face width of 2 inches is the width of the gear if you were to actually measure it with a caliper as you're going from one face of the gear to the other face. So the circular pitch P is 0.3927 because that's pi divided by 8. The normal circular pitch P sub n is the pitch P, which is the 0.3927 number, times the cosine of 30 degrees. The axial pitch PX is circular pitch P, 0.3927, divided by the tangent of 30 degrees. The pitch diameter is N, the number of teeth 45, divided by the transverse diametral pitch PD8, that gets 5.625. The normal pressure angle is a tough calculation. You have to take the arctan of the tangent of the transverse pressure angle times the cosine of the helix angle. So that takes a little bit of coding in Excel to do. The number of axial pitches is equal to the face width divided by P sub X, which is the axial pitch. So you take 2, divide by 0.682. The minimum number of axial pitches that you should have in helical gears is 2. So in this design, the number that you have is greater than 2, so you would have good meshing action between the helical gear teeth. Here's how a straight bevel gear drive works. In straight bevel gears, the teeth are straight, but the top land of the gear is angled at the pitch cone angle. So here, you no longer have a tooth that is parallel to the face of the gear. The tooth is actually angled down. This tooth is angled back. And the main axes of the gears are usually perpendicular to each other. So here's one axis this way. Here's the other axis that way in space. In addition to speed reduction and torque increase, you also change the axis of rotation of the shafts by 90 degrees. As you saw, in a GIF file before, on a differential, the straight bevel gear drives are used in automotive differentials. So let's show you a GIF file of how bevel gears work. Also pretty mesmerizing, particularly if you watch the gears mesh in the lower right corner. Let's define the dimensions for straight bevel gears. First, the easy one shown in the lower left corner. The pitch diameter equals the number of teeth in the pinion divided by the diameter of the pinion, which also equals the number of teeth divided by the diameter of the gear. That's no different than any of the other gears we've talked about. And now for the hard ones. The pitch cone angle for the gear, capital lambda, shown here, is the angle between the face of the gear and the horizontal. The pitch cone angle for the pinion, shown here, which is small gamma, is the included angle between the two faces of the pinion. The face width of the gear F is measured across the face but at an angle perpendicular to the outer edge. You have a dimension called the outer cone distance that is a perpendicular from the outer edge of the gear to this theoretical center point on which the pitch cone angles are measured. And then you have the more practical dimensions that don't relate to how you machine the gear or how the gears match. They just relate to if you were to package these gears. The pitch diameter capital D of the gear gives you the horizontal distance across the full work envelope of the gear. Likewise, the pitch diameter of the pinion, small d, gives you the entire vertical work envelope across the pinion. And those two dimensions are important to make sure you don't have any mechanical interference with other parts. And then we have this important dimension called the mounting distance. 
That tells you how far is it from the center of a shaft that would hold the gear to the right edge, which is a vertical line of the pinion. And then you have this other mounting dimension that tells you how far is it from the center line of the shaft that holds the pinion to this bottom edge of the gear. Table 8-8 has the kinematic formula for straight bevel gears. We'll review a couple of them. The gear ratio, M sub G, is no different than for the other gears. You just take the number of teeth in the gear and divide out by the number of teeth in the pinion. We went over the pitch diameters before, and these are the definitions for the pinion cone angle and the gear cone angle. To get the pinion cone angle, you take the arc tangent of the number of teeth in the pinion divided by the number of teeth in the gear. And for the gear pitch cone angle, you take the arc tangent of the number of teeth in the gear divided by the number of teeth in the pinion. And for those of you who know your geometric formulas very well, you'll know this right now. The sum of small gamma and large gamma is always 90 degrees. If you go to buy a bevel gear pair online, this is the kind of information that you're going to get. You're wanting to know what's the pitch diameter. Here we have 6, 8, and 10 are your choices. What are the diameter of the gear and pinion? and what are the critical mounting dimensions, but they won't bother with any of the internal dimensions that relate to the gear teeth because if you're buying a gear, you don't really need to know that. You're just trying to use the gear. Here is bevel gear geometry problem number 8-45. It says a straight bevel gear pair has the following data. NP is 15, NG is 45, PD is six, 20 degree pressure angle, and they want you to compute some of the geometric terms. We've dyed in all the inputs in a gray area up at the top. And we see for the first few rows, we can do some math calculations. The gear ratio is just 45 over 15, which is three. The pitch pinion diameter is 15 over six, which is two and a half. The gear pitch diameter is 45 over six, which is seven and a half. We use our trigonometric formulas to get our pitch cone angle and our gear cone angle. And if you do the math, you'll see those two numbers, 71 and change and 18 and change add up to 90 degrees. The outer cone distance, A sub zero is 0.5 times the diameter times sine of the pitch cone angle for the gear and a few other calculations on the bottom that you might need. Now let's discuss how a worm gear drive works. Worm gear drives are used to transmit motion and power between non-intersecting shafts that are 90 degrees of rotation apart. So here is a shaft that is going in one direction. Here's a shaft going through the worm that goes in the other direction. The shafts are at a 90 degree angle and they're skewed and they don't intersect. You usually connect the worm to a motor. The worm drives the gear, typically with 10 times or more increase in torque and 10 times more decrease in speed. The gear has teeth that roughly resemble that of a spur gear, but with one big exception, the teeth are not straight across the top. They come down in the middle and then go up, and that's to avoid interference in the middle with the rotating worm. And the worm has teeth very similar in shape to a screw thread. The helix angle is very large. You can see that one reason for the teeth of the gear to have an arc on them is because they have to clear these threads of the worm. Otherwise, the teeth would actually be interfering. And the worm does look like a rotating screw. So let's go over pros and cons of a worm gear drive. On the plus side, you get extremely large gear ratios, typically up to 360 to one in a tiny compact package because of the small number of teeth on the worm. 
And if the lead angle of the worm is small enough, usually less than six degrees, the worm can be self-locking, which means it can't be back-driven from the worm gear so it can actually hold a load. Meaning if you try to take your fingers and turn the worm gear, you're not gonna get the worm to move, which is very different from most other gears where you can spin them freely with your fingers. A locking action in the worm gear drive is produced by the very high friction between the worm threads and the worm gear teeth. But then that leads to the first detraction of using a worm gear drive. They have relatively low efficiency compared to other gear sets, usually somewhere in the 65 to 75% instead of 99%. And the sliding, not rolling motion between the teeth generates not only the friction, but it generates significant heat, which then limits the worm set's life. In other words, the life of these worm gear drives are not limited by the stress in the teeth. They're, they're limited by the fact that the heat buildup changes the met metallurgy. And for high power applications, the oil temperature, which you'll always need an oil bath in a high powered worm gear drive, should be kept below 200 degrees F if you want a long gear life, which means you may need a significant batch size of oil. Here are the worm gear geometry equations, some of them familiar, as the diametral pitch is, PD equals the number of teeth in the gear divided by the diameter of the gear. But the ones for the worm are new, so let me first explain in the picture what these terms mean. The axial pitch is from a thread of the worm to a thread going along the direction of the axis of the worm. And the normal pitch here would be if you were to drop a perpendicular from these slanted worm threads and measure it that way. The lead angle is distance between a vertical line and the angular plane going through the threads. The hub diameter is for the outer edges of the worm gear. What do you machine that to? And the pitch diameter is roughly, but not exactly, the outer diameter of the worm. The pitch diameter being slightly inboard of the actual diameter you would measure for the worm if you took a caliper and measured it. And this triangle here represents a triangle formed by the lead angle and its vertical and its angled line. Greek letter lambda applies to the lead angle. The lead is the vertical line in this triangle. The length of thread is the hypotenuse and the pitch circumference of the worm is equal to pi times the worm diameter where the worm diameter is actually the outer diameter of the worm. The lead equals the number of threads in the worm times the axial pitch, where n sub w is the number of threads and p sub x is the axial pitch. Let's review the worm gear motion equations. The pitch line speed v sub t is the same basic equation that we had in spur gears. For the worm, it's just pi times the diameter of worm times the rotational speed of the worm divided by 12 as measured in feet per minute. For the worm gear having pitch diameter d sub g rotating at n sub g rpm, then the tangential velocity of the gear is just pi times the gear diameter times the rotational speed n sub g divided by 12. Your units of measure will then be in feet per minute. And unlike the other gears, the pitch line speeds for the worm and the gear are not the same, nor will they be close. The velocity ratio for the worm-worm gear set, however, is the same formula we've had for the other gears, where if you want to take the velocity ratio of a worm gear set, you take the rotational speed of the worm and divide by the rotational speed of the gear. Here's some more worm gear dimensions from our textbook. These are all the critical dimensions that you need if you actually wanted to manufacture a worm and a worm gear. Focus instead 
for this lecture on a couple of the critical dimensions, this pitch diameter of the gear you can see from the outline of the gear is not the outer edge. It's in the middle of the gear and it's this pitch diameter of the gear that actually mates with the pitch diameter of the worm. Let's do a practice problem, worm gear geometry problem number 8-52. A worm gear set has a single thread worm with a pitch diameter of 1.25 inches, a diametral pitch of 10, and a normal pressure angle of 14.5 degrees. If the worm meshes with the worm gear having 40 teeth and a face width of 0.625 inches, compute the lead, axial pitch, circular pitch, and other geometric dimensions in the worm gear pair. So here we've dialed in our input data in the gray background. All these numbers up top is what I was reading before. We can calculate the circular pitch P by taking pi and dividing by the diametral pitch to get 0.314. And in the case of a worm, the axial pitch of the worm is equal to the circular pitch, so that's also 0.314, and the lead is equal to the number of worm threads times the axial pitch. So 1.1 times 0.314 is still 0.314. The lead angle of the worm is the inverse tangent of the lead divided by the product of pi and the worm pitch diameter d sub w. That gets 4.574 degrees. This number will usually be in the single digits. And the year pitch diameter d sub g is an easy one to calculate. We just take 40 for the number of gear teeth, divide by 10 for the diametral pitch. Center distance is the same formula we've had with other gears. You just take the 1.25 inch number for the worm pitch diameter and add it to the gear pitch diameter of 4, divide by 2, and then you get 2.625. And the velocity ratio is 40 to 1 because it's 40 gear teeth divided by one worm thread. You're probably wondering what some of these parts look like in real life. They look nice in pictures, but never have seen one or had one in your hands. So I made a video on tearing down a broken paper shredder that I had. The paper shredder had a series of worm gears, spur gears, fasteners and other parts that we study in this class, including a DC motor. You're more than welcome to view it on YouTube. My only request is that you give me thumbs up only. I am trying to get my YouTube ratings up and any thumbs down is really going to hurt bad. So if you don't like the video, just click away. If you like it, I always appreciate thumbs up. The velocity ratio for two mesh gears is the angular velocity of the input gear divided by the angular velocity of the output gear. But if you substitute for the radii, diameter, or speeds in RPM, given these equations below for the radius or for the diameter or the rotational speed, the velocity ratio can then be defined in seven different ways. And this is shown here on the bottom of the slide. You can define it as the speed in RPM of the pinion divided by the speed of the gear or the radius of the gear divided by the radius of the pinion. Any of these equations will do. Just make sure that you carefully note whether the pinion dimension is in the numerator or whether the gear dimension is in the numerator of these equations. Gear trains have a rotation direction change at each stage. For this rotation, the red gear is going clockwise, the blue gear therefore goes counterclockwise, the yellow gear is on the same shaft as the blue gear, so it keeps going counterclockwise, and the green gear winds up going clockwise. So in this system, the green gear is going to be rotating in the same direction as the red gear, but not at the same speed. A train value for gear trains is similar to a velocity ratio, but you use a train value when you have more than two gears in mesh. In this particular example, we have four gears. Pinion A drives gear B. Pinion C is on the same shaft as gear B. And pinion C drives gear D. The velocity ratio of gears A and B is the speed of 
a divided by the speed of b and the velocity ratio between gears c and d is the speed of c divided by the speed of d. The train value becomes the speed of a times the speed of c divided by the speed of b times the speed of d but because b and c are on the same shaft they cancel and then the train value just becomes the speed of gear A divided by the speed of gear D. But there's only one problem. In this particular example, we're not told the speeds of the gears. We're only told the number of teeth on the gears. So we have to calculate the train value in a different way. If you look in the lower right corner, we see that the train value is calculated as the number of teeth on gear B divided by the number of teeth on pinion A times the number of teeth on pinion C divided by the number of teeth on gear D. And we are given those values. We calculate the train value as 70 divided by 20 times 54 divided by 18, and that equals 10.5. Idler gears perform as both a driving and a driven gear, and they're used to fill a void between two gears when it's not possible to bring the shafts of the two gears close enough to meet the center distance requirement. If you didn't put an idler gear there, you'd have a big gap and then you would never transfer the power from the driving gear A to driven gear C. And they don't affect the train value because the number of teeth appear in the numerator and the denominator of the train value equation. In this example, Driver A is going counterclockwise. It drives the idler gear B, which goes clockwise. And idler gear B drives gear C, which then goes counterclockwise with no change in the speed between the shaft where gear A is and the shaft where gear C is. Let's take a look at this GIF file. You can see that A and C are totally in sync with each other. An internal gear is one where the teeth are machined on the inside of a ring instead of on the outside of a gear block. The gear rotates in the same direction as the pinion. So in this case, the pinion is rotating clockwise and it drives the ring gear, which is also going clockwise. The center distance is a slightly different calculation than what we had for two gears. For the center distance, you take the diameter of the ring gear and you subtract the diameter of the pinion and then you divide by two. Internal gears are used in tight spaces where rotational direction must remain the same. So in this design, we have a sun gear which was rotating counterclockwise and it drives pinion, which is rotating clockwise, drives the ring, which is rotating clockwise. Therefore, the pinion and the ring are rotating in the same direction. Let's take a look at this GIF file. In a rack and pinion gear set, the gear, which is essentially the rack, has infinite radius, so it's flat and the pinion is as before. The pinion is rotating counterclockwise, and when that happens, the rack moves to the right. If you were to rotate the pinion clockwise, then the rack would rotate to the left. And the rack and pinion gear set are commonly used in car steering mechanisms. You listen to a car commercial on TV, and they talk about rack and pinion steering. You'll know where that came from. In this design, the linear velocity of the rack is equal to the tangential velocity, which is equal to the radius of the pinion times the angular velocity of the pinion. And the center line of the pinion to the back of the rack is what's called the pitch line dimension of the rack plus half the diameter of the pinion. There's three methods of designing a gear train. You can have a single pair of gears to produce a desired velocity ratio, which would be great, and then it's not really a gear train, of course, because there's only two gears. But that doesn't happen very often in advanced machines like transmissions, because you're not able to find some combination of teeth in the pinion and gear that can produce the correct ratio that you need. 
So the second method is called a residual ratio. And this process is used for high velocity ratios when two or more pairs of gears in a gear train are required. And in this method, you specify all but one of the required gear ratios to produce an overall train value. Then you compute the required value of the final ratio. And it's the most general approach and most frequently used approach in this book. And we'll have an example for you in a moment. In the factoring approach, you use it when two or more pairs of gears in a gear train are required and an exact ratio for the overall train value is required. In that case, the velocity ratio of each gear pair must be a factor of the overall train value. For example, if you wanted a train value of 64, then you just use three pair of gears. Each has a gear ratio of four because four cubed is equal to 64. The reason factoring approach doesn't often occur is that it's not common that you wind up with needing a train value that has integer factors. And hence the residual ratio is the one that's more common. Here's complex gear geometry problem number 8-58. In this problem, the input shaft for the gear train shown in the figure rotates at 3,450 RPM clockwise. And we want to compute the rotational speed and direction of the output shaft. Pinion A drives gear B. Pinion C is on the same shaft as gear B and drives gear D. Pinion E is on the same shaft as gear D and drives gear F. Pinion G is on the same shaft as gear F. It drives idler H, which in turn drives gear I, and gear I is connected to the output shaft. And we show all the different gear ratios. For example, the ratio from gear B to gear A is 4.56, which is just 82 divided by 18. And the way we do this is just to create a simple spreadsheet where we show the number of teeth in the pinions and the gears. Then we show the formula in the next column. We show the stage velocity ratio. And then in the last column on the right, we define whether it changes direction. And we just multiply all the stage velocity ratios to get the total train value. And you divide that into a 3,450 input RPM, and the output speed is 17.32 RPM. Now there's one question you haven't asked me, and that's what's up with these negative numbers. The reason we assign the negative numbers for these stage velocity ratios is we want to understand is the direction of rotation of a gear changing or not. So if the direction of rotation changes, we give a negative value to the stage velocity ratio, and if not, we give a positive value. We have five different negative numbers, which gives a negative number for the total velocity ratio, which tells us that the final train value includes the fact that the output gear is rotating in a different direction from the input gear. The input gear in this problem was clockwise, and so the output gear is counterclockwise. Let's solve gear train problem 8-67. We will devise a gear train using external gears on parallel shafts. We'll use 20 degree full depth involute teeth and no more than 150 teeth in any gear. We'll use table 8-7 as a guideline to guarantee that there is no gear tooth interference. We'll show you a rough sketch of the layout. The input speed is 1800 RPM, and the output speed must be in the range of 21 to 22 RPM. Here's our step-by-step -step procedure. We'll use the residual ratio method and spur gears as they are the simplest and lowest cost gears for parallel shafts. The nominal train value equals 1800 over 21 and a half, halfway between 21 and 22, and that equals 83.7. Per table 8-7, we use at least 17 teeth on each pinion. Then the maximum velocity ratio for each gear pinion pair is 150 over 17, and that's 8.83. Well, suppose we did two gear pinion pairs in our gear train. 
Then the velocity ratio would be 8.83 squared, which is 77.85. But because 77.85 is less than 83.7, we'll need to use three pinion gear pairs, not two. Let's try having three equal velocity ratios. Then the train value is the cube root of 83.7 which equals 4.37. We must make sure that the number of teeth in any gear is an integer, which rules out a velocity ratio of exactly 4.37. Let's try using ratios near 4.37, like 4 or 5. This way we can pick the number of pinion teeth and know that the mating gear will have an integer number of teeth. In order to keep the train value for the system at 83.7, we want to alternate the individual velocity ratios. Let's start with 5, then 4, and see what last ratio we need to get to 83.7. To keep the gear train compact, let's have each pinion have the minimum 17 teeth. Then the number of teeth in a equals 17, and the number of teeth in gear B equals 17 by 5, which is 85. Then the number of teeth in pinion C is 17, and the number of teeth in gear D is 17 times 4, which equals 68. And the train value for the two pinion gear pair is 4 times 5, which equals 20 which means that the velocity ratio for the third pair is equal to 83.7 divided by 20, which was 4.19. With pinion E having 17 teeth, gear F has 17 times 4.19, which equals 71.23 teeth. But we can't have 71.23 teeth in a gear. So we round the number of teeth in gear F to 71. Then the actual ratio of the third pair is 71 divided by 17, which equals 4.18. We need now to recalculate the revised train value and the output RPM to see if they meet spec. The revised train value is equal to 5 times 4 times 4.18, which equals 83.53. And the output RPM is 1800 divided by 83.53, which equals 21.55. This is an acceptable output RPM because the spec was for the output to be between 21 and 22 RPM. And here's an Excel spreadsheet showing the solution to problem 8-67. We give you the number of teeth in each gear opinion. We give you the stage velocity ratio formula, and we calculate for you the train value. In this case, with three changes in direction, the output would be rotating at the opposite direction of the input.